so we are live okay good evening welcome to i focus lecture 61 today we have dr shrinivas rao from darshan i care chennai speaking to us on disorders of the ocular surface it will be an interactive talk let me briefly introduce shrinivas uh, everyone knows him but uh, you know i i have to introduce him because he has lot of accomplishments he is from madras medical college and he was the best outgoing student in mbbs he did uh, uh, ophthalmology training in shankarnetralaya and then he became a consultant there and uh, was a senior consultant for a good 15 years in the middle some time he did frcs and uh, i never met anybody who was a gold medalist in frcs so he was one for the best performance of the year then he moved to uh, hong kong briefly as professor in the chinese university of hong kong then he came back i think in 2006 about 14 years ago and established darshan eye care and uh, surgical center he is also concurrently the head of cornea at shankara hai hospital and uh, sunetra in chennai and ophthalmic consultant to madras medical mission he is visiting professor at uh, several universities uh he has been interested in ocular surface and complex ocular surface problems for several years and he has a uh, quarter century experience in this area he has many first to his credit complex surgical technique including limbus and stem cell transplants uh, lamellar keratoplasty techniques autographs for keratogenesis and also keratoprosthesis he was very well known for initiation of keratoprosthesis a complex surgical procedure in india and training several fellows in shankarnetralaya which uh, later took up this particular surgery and he continues to do all this in his uh, private practice one thing to his credit is the module host or handbook of ocular surface treatment which is a comprehensive resource for diagnosis and management and he was also the president of cornea society of india so i have left out many of his awards and uh, orations etc just to fit things to into one slide and we have shrinivas he is a fantastic speaker and i'm sure you'll spend the next one hour um, very effortlessly over to you shrinivas i'll stop sharing my slides you can start sharing okay thank you santosh and uh, again let me congratulate you and your team on this uh, effort i think it's a whole lot of effort that needs to go in to organize something of this magnitude i believe this is the 61st lecture in the series and i'm sure there are plenty more to follow so essentially probably or more so congratulations on, on all that and uh, to keep up this effort in these trying times i'm sure a lot of the post graduates are finding this very useful so thank you again for having me today and uh, for the post graduates who are possibly the target audience for this uh, feel free to ask questions at any point in time we can stop discuss this is not really a lecture we have about an hour so i'm going to try and cover this area of ocular surface disorders the problem is that this is not a single entity as you probably know um, to have a normal and healthy ocular surface is a blessing most of us take it for granted and when you work in an ocular surface clinic like i do and see the misery of these patients who don't have a healthy ocular surface you then begin to understand how important the normal is so this is a healthy ocular surface you see a nice smiling cornea you see the light reflex which is nice and sharply focused which means that the tear film and the epithelium are perfectly healthy you see the healthy lids you see the normal position of the lids you see the healthy limbus so all of this technically is the ocular surface it's not a single entity So, if you really want to break it down in terms of its component parts, you have the tear film, which has multiple layers. Then you basically have the lids with their adnexal structures, the lashes, the meibomian glands, and then you have the tears, which have to drain. There's a turnover process for the tears. The tears come onto the surface, the blink spreads them across the corneal and conjunctival surface, and then they have to drain normally through the medial part, through the puncta and the lacrimal drainage system. and then you have the corneal epithelium you have the conjunctival epithelium the two are separated by the limbus which as you know is a very vital component of the entire ocular surface and these are the anatomical or structural elements that constitute the os you also have in the background you have the nerves that work you have the immune cells that work you have the vascular input you have the humoral input you have the endocrine input so there's a lot of things that are happening on the ocular surface at any given time and therefore the ocular surface disorder itself turns out to be a fairly complex topic so i'm going to 
to try and take you through some of them. Um, it's impossible to cover everything in an hour, but I'm trying to touch upon the salient points. But like I said, if there's anything that's uh, you know a matter for concern or something that you think is not being covered, please feel free to stop me at any point and we can discuss that as well. Now, just to set the tone for what I said and to basically build on what I talked about in the previous slide and to show you that the ocular surface is not necessarily a simple element. This is a gentleman who is about 60 plus. He's had a multifocal IOL implant done in both eyes about, I think about six, seven months earlier. And then he comes in like this with a lot of complaints. He says that he's not happy at all as far as his ocular surface is concerned. He's got a lot of itching, burning. He's unable to read the usual symptoms that all of them come with. Now, it's very important for you to be able to look at what is happening and pick up the findings, because if you don't pick up the findings, you can't treat an ocular surface issue properly. So I just wanted to share with you some of the findings on this particular slide. So this is how the eyes look on the slit lamp here, and this is how he looks on external examination. The findings, if you want to put them in the order, basically there is a lot of orbital fat prolapse. You can see these baggy lids here. You can see the dermatocalysis, these loose folds of skin which are pushing down on the eyelid. And you can actually see that the left upper lid is not at the same position as the right upper lid. It's actually drooping a little bit. He's got a bit of a brotosis and he's got a fair bit of frontalis overaction. You can see the wrinkles here. He's trying to elevate this because of the weight of the skin folds of the dermatocalysis pushing down on the eyelids. If you go on to the slit lamp, you find the lids are lax and inverted. Normally, the lower lid somewhere here at the position of the lower limbus, you can see the little extensive amount of uh, inferior scleral show. You can see some amount of meibomian gland dysfunction. You can see the conjunctiva calesis. You can see these little folds here in the conjunctiva. This is called the lip cough or the lid parallel conjunctival folds. And then it goes on to becoming frank folds or calesis. You can see the increased tear meniscus here. You can see the light reflex from the tear meniscus both here and here. So there's a bit of tear stasis because of the lax lids, the lids are not draining the tears properly. And because the tears are not draining properly, they're staying on the surface. All the muck on the surface is not exiting the surface as it should. So there is inflammation and you can see this mild non-specific congestion. So there's a lot of things happening on the ocular surface and therefore it is foolish to kind of just treat this as a tear problem and give them artificial tears and send them off. This is what the operating surgeon had been doing, unfortunately, for three months. The patient didn't feel better, so he sought a second opinion. So we're going to start with tear problems of the surface because that is one large component of tear surf and ocular surface problems. But I just wanted to start by telling you that don't believe that every patient who comes to you with irritation has only a tear problem. He probably has a tear problem, but he also has a number of other things going on on the surface. And we need to pick these up to be able to treat them properly. And if you think about tear deficiency itself, it's not a single or a single simple entity. It's not simple as saying tears, give them any artificial tear that you have and send them away and everything will be fine. There's a lot of genetics involved. There's a lot of environmental factors involved. There's spatial physiognomy. We know that in the Far East, the Chinese have very tight palpebral fissures. The Caucasians have very large eyes. They have a lot of exposure of the ocular surface. There's work practices involved. You could be a farmer working outdoors in the heat and dust all the time. Or you could be a computer professional sitting for 12 hours in an AC room staring at a video display terminal. There are cultural and other unknown issues when you look at different populations with this disease. We still don't have very standardized diagnostic methods for this. The symptoms and signs often do not match. And what few tests that we do have are not particularly standardized in terms of interpretation of the results. The definition of the dry eye itself constantly keeps changing. We're adding to it as we understand more. And in di different populations and different on the physician's interest in this condition, the diagnosis can be made at different times. If you think about the patient and the disease profile, when you're trying to recognize this condition, you can get a wide spectrum of people there. You can have an elderly 70-year-old postmenopausal woman with a dry eye. You can have a 30-year-old computer professional coming to you with similar symptoms because he sits 14 hours in front of a screen in an AC room. You can have people who had multiple surgical procedures and neurotrophic changes. You could have those with underlying systemic conditions like somebody who's had rheumatoid arthritis for 15 or 16 years and who has it. And there could be other contributing factors adding on to this as well. So it's not one entity as far as the patient profile is concerned. A number of people come into this pool. And finally, when you look at the dry eye itself, I like to think of it as a basket. You could have an aqueous tear problem. You could have a meibomian gland problem, which means there's some lipid issues on the tear film. 
you could have some problems with the mucus component of the tear film or with the epithelium of the surface, which means you have tears, but they're not being held onto the surface because the epithelium is unhealthy. You could have lid problems. Either the lid is not blinking at all and there's a lot of evaporation, or it's blinking very poorly and it's not taking the tears off the surface, or basically it's blinking so much that it's causing a lot of trauma to the surface from the repeated blinking. So lack of tears is a problem, but tear stasis is also a problem. Like we saw in the previous slide and that gentleman, you can have inflammation. And if you have conjunctival calasis in an elderly eye, it again comes into the mix and interferes with the proper flow of the tears. So when we talk about tear problems, you have a number of issues that you must keep in mind. Again, when we talked about contributing factors, there are many things that can work on a tear film and the ocular surface. So don't think of tears as a sim sim single entity and just say there's a tear deficiency. We know conjunctivitis, adenoviral conjunctivitis is getting very common these days. So before, during, and after you can have problems. Allergies that cause these kind of changes can. Asthenopic changes, if you have people sitting in front of a computer all day long, you can have problems like this. You could have basically problems like canaliculitis affecting the medial cancel region. You could have thyroid eye disease like this. You can have contact lens induced changes. You can have lag of thelmos if the lid is not able, lid is not able to close completely. You can have filaments on the surface. You can have concretions on the palpebral conjunctiva. This is the classical aqueous tear deficiency. The environment in which you function all the time. If you're using a lot of drops, either the medication or the preservative in these medications can hurt you over a period of time. If you have an obese individual who snores and therefore sleeps on his place, you can have a floppy eyelid syndrome. You can have immunodeficiency symptoms with HIV, you can have dry eye, you can have tumors on the surface causing problems. You can have a lax lid and functal eversion. Normally, you cannot see the lower functum until you pull the lid down with your finger. Here, you can already see it without touching the lid, which means the lid is everted. You can have a lid viper epitheliopathy as seen by the staining with lysimine green on the upper lid when you flip it open. You can have the lip cough or the conjunctival calasis that I spoke about. The lid margin can be host to a variety of parasites. This is the louse, the thyrus. You can have basically mebomian gland dysfunction. You can have staph or seborrheic blepharitis. You can have limbal stem cell deficiency. This is obviously a gross version, but you can have more subtle versions. Medication toxicity. This is something called the morning eye congestion syndrome when people wake up with an angry looking red eye when they worked long hours the previous day and they have a dry eye. Because when you sleep, all the bad stuff keeps collecting on the surface. It has nowhere to go. And in the morning when you wake up, you have this congestion. This is the mucus fishing syndrome where the patient's making things worse. You could have neurotrophic changes. You can have something like a carotid cavernous fistula causing these changes. And this can be missed as a red eye or just basically a common ocular surface problem. You can have basement membrane changes in the corneal epithelium. People with Parkinsonism, this is obviously Muhammad Ali, he had it. They don't blink at all. They can sit in your office and talk to you for three or four minutes and not blink a single time. And that will basically play havoc with the surface. The lid mask can get characterized in various conditions, typically Stevens-Johnson. You can have acne rosacea. You can have superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. You can have staph immune keratitis. You can have changes in the contour on the ocular surface, a pterygium like this or a pingicula. Edema in the cornea, again causing contour changes. You can have a variety of systemic medications that people are on which can impact the surface and the tears, and you can have tear stasis. So any one or more of these conditions can be at work or at play in the surface of the patient that presents to you with symptoms. And unfortunately, just looking at the symptoms, it is not possible to say what is happening. Now the deuce to try to make things a little more standardized, but they're making it even more complicated. And this famous cartoon, I'm sure all of you know and you've seen, this is from the deuce to report. So basically they say, if the patient's symptoms suggest a dry eye, you ask a few leading questions. Maybe you can, and if you basically find that the patient does have a positive response to these questions from the symptomatology, you can put him through a dry eye questionnaire. You can, in India, the OSDI is freely available. In there, they use the dry eye questionnaire five. So if the OSDI score is 13 or more, then you suspect that he has a dry eye, and then you look for markers of loss of homeostasis. This could be a non-invasive tear breakup time. It can look at the osmolarity of the tear film or you can look at ocular surface staining. If these, any one of these three are present, it means that you are dealing with a tear problem on the surface, and then you make more efforts to try and decide what part of the spectrum of tear disorder the patient fits in, meaning it could be aqueous deficient on one hand, or it could be an evaporative on the other, and there's a spectrum, so the patient could be somewhere in the middle as well. So in order to decide which 
part of the spectrum he belongs to. They suggest that you can measure the tear meniscus height. They suggest that you can look at the mevomian glands by doing mebography. And you look at the lipid levels on the tear film by doing an interferometry. So this is taking things more and more complicated in terms of the equipment needed to make the diagnosis. So you need an NIBUT. They said that if you put fluorescein with a teardrop and put it into the eye, you're altering the surface physiology. That would do an NIBUT, which means you project a grid on the surface onto the tear film and the machine detects when the grid breaks up. So the red spot is where it broke up very small and the yellow and the orange are basically when the time frame increases. So you can get all kinds of metrics as to where it broke down, when it broke down and it's supposed to be more physiological, but you need a device to do this. The tear volume, basically it is suggested that you measure the tear meniscus height. Again, you need a device to do this. Lipid interferometry measures either the film, the interference film on the tear surface, or you can actually measure the thickness of the lipid there. Again, needs a device. You can look at the mebomin glands using infrared mebography. So this tells you whether the gland architecture is normal, how much of gland dropout there is. And then you look at the congestion on the surface, which is a surrogate marker for inflammation. And this, again, you can compare with some kind of standardized scale to give you a score. So this is all good, but unfortunately, it requires a costly device to do. And it can do all of this in one single you know, click. And it gives you a nice composite report like this. So basically, this is the values. And the arrow is for the patient's right eye and for the left eye. So if the arrow is somewhere in the red, it means the value is abnormal. If the arrow is in the green, it means that particular parameter is normal. This is all very nice, but it's costly both when you do it each time. So there's a cost to the patient and there's a capital cost to buying the device. So we need to focus on clinical skills in the beginning at least before we go on to these costly devices. So when we listen to the patient who comes to you with what seemingly is a dry eye problem, you need to look at the duration of his problem, how severe it is and whether it is progressing over a period of time. You ask him for what are the initiating factors, what are the aggravating factors and what are the factors that make him feel better. It's important to know whether the condition is worse in the morning or does it get worse through the day? Is there any fluctuation in his vision and what treatment has he received and what is the benefit of that treatment that he has had, if any? And also a systemic history. Does he have a dry mouth? Does he have joint pains? Does he have anything else that could be aggravating or putting up this? When you do a clinical exam, you need to do a focused exam. There are a lot of clues that you can get. If you remember that composite slide that I put up in the third or fourth slide with all the conditions that can impact this problem. You just need to pick up the findings that each of those conditions causes. And in the general exam, when you're looking at the patient's face as you're talking to him, you can pick up prostatia. There will be the butterfly acne distribution. You'll see the rhinophyma on the nose. You can pick up the SLE again by the rash on the face. When the patient hands you his prescriptions, you look at his hands. If he has rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic disease, he will have joint deformities and that can these conditions impact the tear film. Or if he has tremors when he's giving you his prescriptions, if it's a very fine tremor, you worry about thyroid. If it's a pill rolling kind of tremor, you think in terms of Parkinson's. And both of these, as I told you, can impact the surface. When you look at the skin, you look for atopic dermatitis, you look for stretched and skiny skin that suggests to have scleroderma. When you look at the scalp, you look for dandruff, you look for ear deformities, which you see in gout and polychondritis. And in the face, the glands, the parotid glands and the submandibular glands, if they are enlarged, you think in terms of the jogrins. If the lymph nodes are involved, you think in terms of the tuberculosis or a perinodes. When you look at the lids, you look at the blink rate. If it's more, you think about a dry eye. If it's very poor blink rate, you think about Parkinsonism. You look at the blink profile. It could be incomplete. So then you ask him about nocturnal lag of thalmos. If it's a very slow blink, it's because he has dermatochalasis. He's scared to close because it makes a lot of effort for him to open so he doesn't blink. And this again affects the ocular surface. You look at the lid structure. Is there any notching or scarring from trauma or trachoma? Is there any vesicles or scars suggest to a fast herpetic infection, which means there could be neurotrophy? Look at the lid position. Is it elevated as in a thyroid, dysthyroid state when he has a lid stare? Or is it drooping either due to senile ptosis or due to myasthenia? How about the lid tension when you're examining the lid, when you pull it and let go, is it snapping back into place or is it very lax, which could suggest in the lower lid, lid eversion, functal eversion, in the upper lid, a floppy eyelid. Look for entropion and ectropion as well. When you look at the lid margins, when you're examining the eye on the slit lamp, you see whether there's excessive tearing from the light of the slit lamp. That means the eye is very irritated or photophobic. 
You look at the tear film quality, you look at the meniscus height and look at the quality in terms of mucus debris in it or interference fringes from oil. You look at the lashes, whether they are misdirected, look for any inflammation in the lid margin suggestive of blepharitis. Look at the mabomain glands and we'll talk about that. And look at the puncta, look at the position, look at the opening, whether it is stenos, whether it is patulous, whether it is inflamed. Look at the ocular surface in terms of the medial canthus. Like I told you, a discharge in the medial canthal region can suggest canaliculitis. If you see keratinization there, you think about OCP. Look at the vulva conjunctiva. Look at the congestion. Look at the contour itself. And the congestion, you look for where it is. Is it nasal, temporal, superior, inferior? Each of these has a significance. Look at the corneal surface. Look at the upper and lower palpebral conjunctiva. See whether there's any scarring, any papillae or follicles. And all of these will give you some clues as to what's going on. Look at the other structures. If you see episterial and steril inflammation or thinning, it could suggest underlying connective tissue disease with its impact on the ocular surface and tear film. Look at the limbal health. If you have an unhealthy limbus, obviously the surface will be inflamed. Look inside the eye. Look at the keratic precipitates on the back of the, on the, back of the cornea. Look for AC reactions. Look at the iris for atrophy, such as to a fast HZO, iris nodules like tuberculosis or sarcoid. And lens sometimes gives you clues because in atopic keratoconjunctivitis, you see a shield cataract in the anterior subcapsular region. And somebody who's been on steroids for his other problems may have a polychromatic posterior uh, subcapsular cataract, which is complicated. Don't forget to look at the rest of the eye, the retina, look for vasculitis and other infections. Look at the pupil and IOP. Look at the orbit itself. Sometimes pseudotumors and cavernous sinus can masquerade in the initial stages as some kind of an ocular surface problem because of the congestion and edema and pain. Look at the orthoptics in terms they have an accommodation of convergence problems and the environment in which the patient works. All of these can impact the ocular surface. So assuming that we are working with our clinical test, which is the BUT, which tells you about the mucus and the stability of the tears on the surface, the Shermer, which gives you the volume of the tears and basically the lifewood in terms of the tear film and mabomin gland function. You have to put these together. Obviously, if all of these values are normal, the patient's eyes ocular surface is also normal. And if all of these are reduced, he has a very severe dry eye, both an aqueous deficiency and an evaporative dry eye. But if you have a Shermer, which is decreased and a lipid, which is normal, you're dealing with an aqueous deficiency dry eye. And if the BUT is normal, it is preclinical. If the BUT is also decreased, it's a clinical aqueous deficiency dry eye. Similarly, if your Schirmer is normal, but your lipid function is decreased, you're dealing with an evaporative dry eye. And again, the BUT will tell you whether it's preclinical or clinical, because as long as the BUT is normal, it means the homeostasis is maintained. But if the BUT also drops, then it becomes a clinical event. Now, one important line that you must see here is somebody who has a normal Shermer, who has a normal lipid profile, but who has a decreased BUT. And this is now increasingly being recognized, typically by the Asia Dry Eye Society and the Japanese. And this is called the short BUT dry eye. Assuming you don't have a corneal problem, which is resulting in a repeated breakdown of the tear film at that particular point, if the cornea is relatively healthy and there's a random breakup here and there. And if it's very short, these people can be very symptomatic and they may have a normal Shermer and a lipid, and I won't pick it up unless you do the BUP here. In addition to this, look for the presence of inflammation on the ocular surface, which is evidenced by the presence of redness and conjunctival congestion. Look for the presence of ocular surface staining, because this tells you whether the homeostasis is lost and the epithelium is getting damaged. And finally, of course, you look at the other conditions that I spoke about. So this is something about the tear film that we were talking about. So you evolve a practical approach. Young patients seldom have dry eyes unless they've had a Stevens Johnson or some chemical injury or something like that. Most of the symptoms in younger age is due to allergies. If you take over young adults, again, they have normally healthy tear films. They have environmental and work-related issues. Typically, as you go into the middle age and later, you can get a dry eye from actual deficiency of tears. And in the elderly group, in addition to possible tear deficit, they will have all of these other age-related changes in and around the eye, and that will give you some clues. Symptoms and signs may not match in this condition. Be aware of that. And finally, of course, this is very important because no matter how much tears he has, if his surface is hurting, there will be staining, and that is something you should pick up and look for these coexisting conditions. You must do a systemic evaluation, particularly if you have a very severe dry eye at the beginning, 
or if you have a severe dry eye in a very young patient, because like I told you, these are not the categories in which you will get it. And then you will go ahead with your treatment. We're not going to talk about details of that here. And once you put it on, you can review the improvement of the patient and then evolve your long-term maintenance strategies because dry eye, like glaucoma, is often a chronic condition. You're not curing it, you're controlling it. And over a period of time, you're trying to bring him to some baseline treatment level. Now, when you need to do a systemic evaluation in these young people with severe dry eyes, this is what I do. I do a hemoglobin, I do a WBC count, I do an ESR and CRP to look for any underlying markers of inflammation. I look for rheumatoid and ANA because these are the most common things that will pick up the most common underlying connective tissue diseases. You do a blood sugar because many of these systemic conditions often need uh, oral steroid therapy and you want to make sure he's not a diabetic. Look at the urine routine and look at the chest x-ray because if he has underlying tuberculosis, again, you don't want to start him on steroids. And if you really think there is a dryness of the mouth or systemic features like tiredness and things like that, you can get a Jogren's antibody profile done as well. Some of the newer options that have come about in managing this condition is this agent called lipitigrass. It's not available in India. It's called Zidra in the US. It's a lymphocyte function agonist inhibitor. So basically, we can also have topical chloroquine that is being tried to reduce inflammation and rebamipide, which briefly came into India and now it's not really available. Rebamipide is a mucin analog. Basically, it is a T2Y2 receptor agonist. So basically, it tries to stimulate the goblet cells in the conjunctiva into producing more mucin. And there's something called true tears, which is basically a nasal prong, which stimulates the nasal secretors in which the nerves. This is believed if you have a long-term dry eye and if there is a fatigue of the receptors on the ocular surface, the stimuli, the afferent system is not working from the surface. Therefore, you're using the nasal receptors to stimulate the lacrimal glands like you do the Shermuth B. So basically you stimulate it with that prong and then there will be some tears. And it was brought in by Allergan. It's not yet come to India. It's showing some promise. Now this is basically a moisture glass. Uh, this is for people with severe dry eye. So when you're also in addition to medicine use, you can try something like this. As you can see, there are side prongs. So then you fit it in, it retains the humidity in the vicinity of the eye. And this often gives a lot of help and relief to patients. When you've used tears and this and it's still troubling the patient, then we use this approach of functal occlusion. So basically, these are the intracanalicular plugs. They're made of silicone. Very easy to insert. This is at the slit lamp with topical anesthetic. Just make sure that it enters the horizontal portion of the canaliculus and this will block the tear drainage. It's quite a safe and simple approach. For those people who can't afford these costly devices, you can do an even simpler surgery. You just infiltrate a little anesthetic in the region of the punctum. Use a calaisian clamp to stop the bleeding and then excise a small rectangle of mucosa from around the punctum, exposing the stroma here. From the phonics of the conjunctiva, just take a snip of conjunctiva, put it into this bed and use four vicryl sutures to keep it in place. The vicryl will fall off after a week or 10 days and the conjunctiva will close the punctum and you can do this very nicely with your surgery itself. There's a concept called the TVSA or the tear volume surface area ratio. So this is a child with head sun or hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy. You can see how bad the corneas are. There's nothing we can do here because our autonomic nervous system is short. So we're never going to get her back, but we can try and slow the damage and keep the cornea from going into you know, perforation and so on by doing a nice lateral tarsography here. And if you do it properly, you can actually re reconstruct the canthus and it doesn't look very inelegant. It looks pretty nice actually. So this is the tear volume surface area concept. So if you have a certain amount of surface area, you need a certain amount of tear volume to keep it well. If the tear volume reduces, you go ahead and concurrently reduce the surface area that is being exposed as well so that you can maintain the ratio between the two. And that is what we're doing here. So with less tears, this lesser exposed surface can do better. So from the tears, the next one we talked about on the ocular surface was the lid. So the lid now is becoming a topic of interest because of the understanding that meibomian glands and their function or dysfunction is very important in ocular surface and dry eye disease. And for those of you who are interested in the IOVS, basically there's a special issue in 2011, volume 52, number four, which deals extensively and exclusively with meibomian gland, various aspects of its function. So when you want to understand the function, you have to first look at the anatomy. So we have over 20 to 25 glands arranged like vertical toothpaste tubes in both lids, upper lid and lower lid. They produce a complex mixture of polar and non-polar lipids. And basically their functions are 
to form a film on the surface of the tears to reduce or slow down the evaporation, maintain a clear optical surface and have a barrier to protect the eye. So when there is dysfunction, the anatomy changes. So this is somebody with a congenital absence of meibomian glands in the lower eyelid. As you can see in this infrared picture, there's only one distorted gland. There are no glands in the rest of the area. And the secretion also alters. So basically, instead of having the normal long chain fatty acids, we get an increase in the short chain fatty acids and triglycerides. And these are very irritating to the ocular surface. And again, if there is less lipid or too much lipid, the function will deteriorate and you'll get a very short tear breakup time and the patient will not be comfortable. So when you want to assess the function, you have to look at the anatomy. You can just flip the normal lid and look at it. So if you learn to look at these little yellow ridges that are present, this is the upper right, obviously. This is a very healthy meibomian gland structure and function. This is, of course, infrared meibography where you can see it in greater detail. But if you can just do a good thorough clinical exam, you will get most of the information. Now, this is a spring-loaded pressure device made by Cobb and Blackie. So basically, you press it against the middle one-third of the lid, and it exerts a graded amount of pressure on the lid. And you're studying the amount of secretions that are coming out of these gland openings. You can replicate this by putting your thumb against the middle third of the lower lid and giving gentle, firm pressure. Normally, the thumb will encompass four to five meibomian gland orifices. So you want to see when you press how many of these glands produce some fluid, how much is the fluid, and what is the quality of the fluid. And this will tell you the physiology. And of course, for function, you need something like a lipid interferometer to measure how thick the tear surface oil is. The changes in the secretion, normally when you put pressure, you will see a small bead of clear fluid. As in this case, when you press, if you see a gush of fluid which is coming out, that is called seboria or excessive secretion. If you press and you get this kind of a white paste coming out like toothpaste, this is called the toothpaste sign and this is seen in meibomitis when there's a lot of inflammation. And the third variety is when the glands have become atrophic, the openings have become cicatrized here, no matter how hard you push, nothing comes out. And this is the sicca or the variety where there is very little secretion from the surface. The lids can have changes as well. So this is the normal eyelid. And here you can see the significant inflammation and the deposition. So you can see these kind of cloudy secretions coming out of the meibomian gland. So this is not a good sign. And you can see this kind of a froth because the oil changes its quality. And when the lids keep blinking, you will get this kind of a froth being worked up from the lipids. You can see seborrheic blepharitis, which is these oily scales present on one side of the eyelash. Or you can see these kind of collarettes, which are basically going all around the base of the lash in a staphylococcal infection. Meibomian plus disease, meibomian gland disease plus disease is when you get the sequelae of these changes, like chalasia. You can see the multiple chalasia here. You can you get corneal changes. This is the staph immune infiltrate that you can see here. And if you see these cylindrical sleeves on the lashes, suggesting a demodex blepharitis. So this is meibomian gland disease with plus disease. The consequences are that if you have a seboria or excessive oil, it contaminates the corneal surface, does not allow the tears to stay on the surface, and you get a very short BUT. On the other hand, if you have very little oil, there is excessive evaporation, the tear film doesn't stay stable. You get an evaporative dry eye with this kind of extensive changes on the corneal surface and the staining. When you get a lot of inflammation from the oil secreting from the lids, you can get this kind of inflammation on the conjunctiva, which is plictenular conjunctivitis. But you can also get keratoconjunctivitis when these changes migrate onto the cornea. And because of the excessive inflammation, if you don't treat it in time, there's a lot of collagenase release, and you can even end up with a perforation if you don't manage it at the adequate time. So when you want to treat meibomian gland disease, we need to know the quantum of oil that is being produced the quality of oil that is being produced and the amount of inflammation that is present on the lid. So for the excess oil, we need to get it out. We traditionally do it by doing warm compresses, scrubbing the lid margin to open up the gland orifices and then doing a physical massage to get it out. And this is the manual method. You have to do it at night for three weeks. It takes about 10 to 12 minutes each time. So those people who are busy, who can't do this or who have money to spend, you can get an automated system like the Lippy Flow, which does the warming and the pulsing and the massaging in an automated session. It takes about half an hour. And then essentially they claim that you can get good relief for somewhere between six to nine months from this. If you have very little oil, what you can do is you can use these masked probes, which are fine stainless steel wires. 
to probe the glands and see if you can open them up or if you have somebody with very excessive secretions which are clogging up the glands you can take them to the or and do a physical expression and get everything out and when you do this you can do this manually and sometimes the oil doesn't come out onto the surface in good amounts because that is usually done by the blinking action of the lids every time the lids blink a small amount of oil is expressed onto the surface and if you have somebody with very lax lids and this tension is not there you can do a surgical procedure to tighten the lids to get this to happen although this is not very commonly done once you've done the gland emptying in order to improve the quality of oil that is produced you can use things like azithromycin topically oral doxycycline and omega 3 fatty acids orally this is the medical approach or you could do something like intense regulated pulse light therapy where you use light and place it along these five areas along the lower eyelid and the lateral canthal region the understanding being that the light stimulates the deeper tissues in the lid the nerves are stimulated and therefore they work on the meibomian glands and this helps to modulate the quality of the oil that is being produced so this is independent from massage so you do this when you think there's a quality issue if you think there's a lot of quantity of oil which is excess you have to massage it out and sometimes you have to do the two together for the inflammation we can use steroids we can use tear substitutes and we can use cyclosporine in the long term so when you see changes like this this is when you want to act and get rid of it if you don't it will go on to corneal changes like this and when you treat it at this stage you will end up with corneal scars so with severe inflammation from lid margin disease when you see this inferior vascularization starting you can treat it at this stage and keep it from going into corneal scarring for plus disease you can either excise the calaision by doing a traditional incision and cure it or you could inject steroid trimsin alone into the lesion and this also works quite well about 85% of the time for basically the demodex we use 5% tea tree oil shampoo which is the himalaya herbal shampoo and the patient can do it at themselves at home at night they massage this shampoo into the lid margin to get rid of the demodex and when you see keratinization this often is seen only in other associated diseases like ocp or stevens johnson syndrome which you have to manage as well but topically you can use vitamin a ointment to try and under to try and get rid of some of this metaplastic change that is happening so treating this common entity which is of different types requires recognition of the type that is happening understanding the pathophysiology and like i shared with you you can either do medical management and or the procedures that we spoke about depending on what is happening on that particular surface continuing with the lids basically these kind of extensive papillary changes are seen when you have allergies we know that in vernal and you can get this kind of a shield ulcer but if you can basically treat them with intensive steroids and get rid of these papillae you can get the surface to heal a more tricky challenge is when you get a shield ulcer which gets infected like this now you have to walk the balance because you have infection on the one hand and allergy on the other one does not do well with steroids the other does well with steroids so you have to combine your antibiotics and steroids judiciously to get this to go away now when you have papillae that are bothering the patient a lot and it's not going away there are few things that you can do one of the things is to block the upper lid punctum so that there's an increase in the tear volume under the lid so that there is less trauma to the cornea when this happens and what i put in there is 40 chromic catgut which works for 2 to 3 weeks and this is the technique of a supratasal injection of half ml of dexamethasone so basically you give it at the upper border of the lid which is flipped and if you've done it correctly when you flip the lid back you shouldn't see a bulge on the eyelid so this is something you can do if you see this kind of localized is keratinization which you see sometimes after stevens johnson it's very easy to shell this plaque you just take a 26 gauge needle and dip it touch it with topical anesthetic and the plaque will go but because this area of the conjunctiva is unhealthy and metaplastic it will reform here so what we have done here after removing this is to put this gentleman on vitamin a ointment and when you do that you can see that over time the quality does change so anecdotally vitamin a top typical therapy in this kind of a condition can be of some help the other more serious entity is when the entire lid margin get keratinized in stevens johnson so what you try and do is you put in a bit of mucus membrane there from the mouth and this is again a fairly simple procedure to do you can do this either under local anesthesia it's a little more cumbersome but you could do it under general anesthesia which is quite easy so basically you can incise the uh, mucosa from the lower lip just taking care to avoid the vermilion border and the frenulum because you don't want to get into those areas there and it does help even if you're doing it under general to basically inject 
uh, adrenaline with local anesthetic there to get some kind of hemostasis there. And then you take uh, uh, basically the, the labial mucosa there with a little bit of the submucosa tissue, trying your best not to destroy too much of the glands there. In the eyelid, basically you incise at the posterior margin and excise that strip of keratinized tissue. You trim down this mucosa nicely, get rid of all the fat. And here we are doing two lids, so it's being split into two. And with the advent of fibrin glue, it's become quite easy now. So this is the gland mucosa that is placed on the lid with the stromal side up. This is the bed sitting here on the top. We just take the fibrin glue, you put it in there, and then you flip this uh, mucosa back into the bed, just like you would for a pterygium. And this will stay there. We do put a layer of sutures basically at the lid margin to keep it in place, not on the inside of the lid, but on the outer margin. And in about 10 days or so, you can remove the sutures and this sticks into place. And this is how this is done. So that is the glue being applied. This is the thin thrombin in the bed and the fibrinogen was already put on the graft. And then you just flip the graft in place so the mucosal surface comes up, add a line of sutures and that will work quite well. This is another condition that we are seeing increasingly in the elderly. This is conjunctiva calasis. You see this excess fold of conjunctiva, which gets traumatized every time the patient blinks. And the stroma is being reflected by this lysamine green staining. And again, if you feel it is not responding to topical therapy and anti-inflammatory therapy, and the patient's very bothered by it, it's quite simple to do a surgical procedure to treat it. So this is the way I do it. So this is done under topical in the OR. So you just pull the loose fold of conjunctiva up so that it have a crescent of excess conjunctiva along the inferior limbus. Use a marking pen to mark this excess fold. And now you inject a very small amount of uh, local anesthetic, maybe about uh, 0.2 to 0.3 mil is all you need. And once you've done that, you can just uh, spread it across the entire conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is very loose here and that's why it's skeletic. So it easily spread across. There's not much of tenons attachments here. So just get it into the area of surgery that you want to do. Now you basically do a careful peritomy close to the limbus, but not adjacent to the limbus because you want to preserve these little uh, limbal stem cells that are there. So you can see there's a small frill that you leave behind. Also, this is the one that you will use to attach the excess, the other edge of the conjunctiva back. Then you follow the marks that you made and you excise a crescentic piece of conjunctival tissue because this is the excess tissue that you want to remove. There's usually not much bleeding, but if you need to, you can also do a little cautery. The, the anesthetic will help you do that as well. But usually it is not required. You just have to wait for a little bit patiently with a little pressure and the bleeding will stop. So once you've done that, basically, again, we take recourse to the fibrin glue. You put that mixture there. And then you basically bring this uh, conjunctiva back, pull it up so that you've now removed the excess conjunctiva. And this tissue will now stick in place and this works quite well as well. The other thing that we see commonly on the ocular surface, particularly in India is a pterygium. And the best way to deal with this is a conjunctival autograph because it addresses most of the pathology that we see. Um, this is a, a video that shows you the most important principles. The pterygium does not produce new conjunctival tissue. So don't waste conjunctiva. You have to preserve it, but the conjunctiva right at the head of the pterygium is often dysplastic and unhealthy and you don't want to retain it because it cosmetically it won't look good. So you leave this part, but preserve as much of the conjunctiva as you can. This is one approach to do it. There are multiple ways to do it. So I tend to leave the head attached onto the cornea until I've dissected the conjunctiva off the body because it serves like a third hand. So the most important thing here is to see the normal sclera at the upper and lower border of the body of the pterygium. If you didn't see that, and if you left a little pterygium in place, and even if you put a conjunctival graft, you will get what is called an around the graft recurrence. So once you've done that and excised, I mean, move the conjunctiva off the body, you identify the plane at which the pterygium goes on to the cornea, and it's relatively simple to shave it off. So this is quite important to do because you don't want to leave these bits and pieces here because later on, cosmetically, it won't be good. And in a primary pterygium, it comes off the sclera very, very easily. So the most important thing here is not to cut off your medial rectus. So you go in a V-shaped manner. Don't go right across the pterygium. Go in a V-shaped manner pointing towards the head of your rectus so that you don't hurt it. Then you smooth the limbus down very nicely. So that is important. So the graft can take. 
and then you do very gentle cautery. You need vascularization here for the graft to take, so don't blanch the conjunctive sclera there with your cautery. You mark the dimensions that you've measured here, here, and the width onto the superior bulba conjunctiva. I like to use cautery to do this because when you cut at the cautery mark, you're cutting only the conjunctiva, and this way you can get a very thin, nice graft without involving the tenons. So as you can see here, the tenons is falling behind. So you just basically cut forwards right up to the limbus. And in a primary pterygium, it is not necessary to include the limbus in your grafted tissue. You can just do a free conjunctival graft as well. It's in a recurrent pterygium that it may be more important for you to include the uh, limbus as well. Take off the tenons right at the uh, limbus. And this way, you can advance the graft. So if you want to take the limbus, this is the technique to do it. So you cut it, and then important thing is not to lift it off the eye. It will furl, and then you lose your orientation. So just slide it onto the cornea and move it into its bed. And then you could either use the sutures or graft or a fibrin glue to keep it in place. Now, if you have a two-headed pterygium, the most effective technique is to do what I showed you there for the larger head and do what is called a rotational graft for the other head. So this is the first head that has been completed. So for the rotational graft, the most important thing is to go well above and below the body of the pterygium. So you don't just cut the conjunctiva over the body, it will shrink. So you go above and below, take the normal conjunctiva as well. So I'm marking only the limbal side, so I know which side is which, because when I bring it back, I want to flip it in place. So again, you do the standard technique, you dissect it off the body of the pterygium, and then using the outline of the marks that I made before with my cautery, I'm excising a nice rectangle of conjunctiva, which was overlying the pterygium. And this can be taken and put aside in a little bowl of saline or whatever, keep it aside. Then you go ahead with the pterygium excision like we did, create the bas scleral bed. And then you get your fibrin glue in place. And now you put the tissue back, remembering to turn the limbal side, which was here. Now the mark is here. We're now going on to the fornicial side. So I'm inverting the graft. But as you can see, it's a nice fit because we took the precaution of going above and below the body of the pterygium. And this is the bed of the original pterygium that's being closed. So this is easily the technique that gives you the best results. The cosmesis with these autographs is excellent. You can hardly see the graft after some time. And the other thing that we're going to just briefly touch upon is tumors. And this is the dysplastic change in the corneal epithelium. This is with mitomycin C, when you use 0.04% uh, four times a day, four days a week for four weeks as a cycle, basically you can get it to go away. You can use it for slightly larger tumors as well. As you can see here, the tumor surface is staining with lysamine green. So this is after two cycles, there's still a small residual lesion here, one more cycle and this will go away as well. But if you have a larger tumor where you want tissue for diagnosis and you don't want to, you know, if you think it's too large for the mitomycin, then you do a surgical excision and get rid of it. And finally, the other important structure on the ocular surface that we spoke about was the limbus, the barrier between the conjunctiva and the cornea. So this is extremely important for your corneal epithelial health. And we know that a number of things can damage it. So this is a patient with a chemical burn. You can see that the limbus has gone off. And just to show you the fellow eye in comparison, which is not injured, you can see the healthy palisades and the limbal cells are good here. So if you have somebody like this who has one eye injured and the other eye healthy, when you wait and you reconstruct the surface and you have this kind of a limbal stem cell deficiency in the affected eye and a healthy limbus in the other eye, we traditionally used to take a piece of limbus from here and a piece of limbus from here, about two clock hours from here and here, remove this panis and then put it in place and put an amniotic over it to allow it to heal. And this works beautifully as well. So basically what happens is, so this is the eye, Injured eye, normal eye, before surgery, you can see the healthy limbus here. So this is two months after reconstruction. So the panis is peeled off. We've taken the limbal tissue from here. This is the bed. You can see the donor eye is quite healthy and the surface reconstructs quite well. But today, based on the work of uh, Sangwan and Basu, from Sayan Basu from LV Prasad, we do a procedure called SLET, which is the simple limbal epithelial transplant. The same principle, we're using limbus from the healthy eye to reconstruct the affected eye, but we're taking a much smaller piece of biopsy and we're growing it on the surface itself. So here, what we do is we remove this entire panis. We first put the amniotic membrane and keep it in place with fibrin glue. And then from here, a small biopsy has been taken. 
And that biopsy has been cut into multiple tiny bits that are put on the amniotic membrane surface. You put a drop of fibrin glue over each of these little bits to keep them in place, put a BCL on top, and then you wait for these cells to start growing on the surface. So over time, this is at two months, you can see that the surface is reconstructed quite well from here to here. You can also do this if you don't have a good donor eye, fellow eye, you can take it as an allograft from another eye and do it, but here you will need immunosuppression. The other surface procedure that I wanted to share is something which everybody can do. It's very simple. So this is somebody with rheumatoid arthritis and a stromal melt in the cornea. So what we have is a decimator seal. So here we need tectonic support to keep it from breaking down. We're going to use cyanoacrylate glue, N-butyl cyanoacrylate. Glue will not stick if the epithelium is intact. So what we are doing to do is gently peel the epithelium using a forcep from around this area. So we can't put it just over this thin area. We need to put it over the stroma as well. So first you remove the epithelium. And this is done in the OR um, with the patient supine using the microscope, but it's done with topical because you get better control when the patient's lying down there. And if you try to do this with the patient seated at the sleep line. So once you've removed the epithelium and dried the surface, you take the glue on a needle, ask the patient to stop moving for a second, and just use a drop and paint it into a very thin layer over the surface. Don't make it with a lot of mountains, peaks, and valleys. Just a very thin film. That's all that is needed. Wait for it to polymerize, put a BCL over it, and that's the procedure. Now, this I think I will not go through today. If you have a corneal tissue loss, then we have to do a tectonic support. I will skip that because I'm running out of time. I just have a last few minutes. So this is the final slide. So sometimes the limbal stem cell deficiency can come with this kind of damage as well. So this is somebody who's had basically a chemical injury. You can see there's a lot of corneal thinning. There's a lot of corneal scarring and total limbal destruction. So there is also a simpliferon in the lower eyelid. So when luckily, if this guy has a good fellow eye, then you can do something to help him. And this is the last video, basically. I need another three minutes. We're at 8.51. So we started at 8.53. So we just take three minutes and then we'll finish this. So what we're trying to do is basically we're trying to do a peritomy now, a 360 degree peritomy. Normally we don't have to go this far down as I'm going here, but here because he has that inferior simpliferon and we'd like to reconstruct that part as well, we've gone further down. Now you have to remove the panis from the ocular surface. So just like a picture that I showed you of the limbal stem cell deficiency, this panis has to go. You need to see the bass stroma. Here, because of the extensive thinning and scarring, we've just removed the epithelium and we're not going into the corneal tissue. And since we want to do a reconstruction of the limbus, the simpliferon, as well as the cornea, we have to do something about the corneal scar. So this is basically a DALC procedure, a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, because he has a normal endothelium in this case. But here, we cannot use the classical ad bubble technique because of the thinning and scarring. That will not work. So what we're doing is basically a manual approach. You go multiple layers until you reach about 85 to 90% depth, which you can judge by looking at the border of the host cornea here. So once you're at about 85 to 90% depth, the number of keratocytes in the residual stroma is very minimal. And therefore the scarring of the interface and all that will not be very significant and you can get a nice reconstruction of the cornea as well. So this process goes on. This is a very highly edited video. So multiple layers are removed. And then once you feel you've reached a nice uniform plane at the correct depth, you can proceed with the rest of it. So the rest of the surgery is just like a DALP that you do otherwise. The donor cornea is sutured in place. And once I have the donor cornea securely in place, I don't need the epithelium on the donor cornea because I'm going to try and reconstruct the limbus myself. So once we have the DALP in place, we go ahead from the fellow eye, which is the healthy eye, and you're removing a limbal biopsy here. As you can see, a very the limbal pig pigment is palisades are being harvested. And in the donor cornea, you remove the epithelium because you don't want that. You're going to give them the epithelium from the fellow eye. Now we are going to put amniotic membrane over the entire surface. So we first put the fibrin glue, and then we bring in the amniotic membrane that drapes everywhere. So this is the amniotic membrane being tucked in, and it will stay because of the fibrin glue. And this will help release the simpliferon as well. And this is the SLED procedure that we spoke about. And then once you've done this and put the BCL, the procedure is over and this is how the eye reconstructs. So basically we've got rid of the simpliferon, we've supported the limbal insufficiency and we've treated the cornea with the DALC as well. So we started off some, something like this and we end up with something like this. So 
I just put this in at the end, basically to tell you that ocular surface disorders can be a complex entity. So multiple things often keep happening on the surface. So as long as you understand what is happening and you understand the physiology of each, and then you have your tools ready, you can put them together in different combinations to try and treat most of these things that we just saw. I think we're at 8.55 now, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing. And if there's any questions that I can take for you, I'll be more than happy to do that. Thank you so much, sir, for extensively covering the topic. So we have a few questions. I'll be taking one by one. Yes. The first yes. one is uh, uh, when to follow the patients with um, woman gland dysfunction and blepharitis, and what is the prognosis in these patients? Um, if you're doing the manual method of massage and all that, normally my protocol is after weeks. Uh, weeks of cleansing and massage for you to see a benefit. So we do that and then we call them back after three weeks. 75% to 80% of people who follow your instructions of massaging and physical cleaning properly will do better. In about 15 to 20% who are recalcitrant despite following the rules, then we go on to a procedure like the pulse light therapy. And the prognosis in these cases is generally very good. It's just that you must tell them in the beginning that they cannot, it's like dandruff, you're not going to get rid of it. It will be there. It will come and go at different times. So you use your shampoo and all that and guru, keep it well for a month. You'll be all right for six months when you stop shampooing. Then it will come back and again you'll take it and put it back. So you explain the analogy and tell them with the lids it's something similar. So we will make it all right. We will keep it well, but that it has to be some patience and some perseverance with it. So the prognosis is generally very good in these cases. Okay. Uh, we have two questions regarding uh, psoriatic patients, sir. The first one is, what is the role of retinoids in psoriasis? Um, retinoic acid, basically, when it is used for acne rosacea, makes the dry eye worse. So we don't have by the dermatologist. So when they give them the retinoids, we tell them that the dry eye in the eye can be worse. So you manage them. Luckily, they don't give it to them for a very long period of time. It's a six week to 12 week course that they give. So if the dermatologist feels it's absolutely essential, he goes ahead with it and we continue to manage the dry eye, which kind of aggravates during that period. And once the acne gets better, they will stop it. And then you can go back to your usual treatment as well. The okay. vitamin A that we are talking about for metaplastic changes on the lid margin is an ointment that we get for ophthalmic use. So that is topical vitamin A that we use. It's not retinoic orally that is given. Okay, sir. The next question is in uh, psoriatic patients undergoing PUVA therapy. So what are the measures we, uh, measures we have to take to prevent dry eye in these patients? There's no dry eye there. So basically they shield the eyes when they go ahead with their therapy. And that's all they need to do. And that they are very well aware of the dermatologist. So they will give them those protective shields and then go ahead. And that's pretty much all we have to worry. So I don't think PUVA has any direct causative role as far as uh, dry eye is concerned. Okay. Uh, one of the panelists is asking to tell on uh, punctal abnormalities and their specific appearance for interpretation when we see. See, the normal punctum is uh, the opening. You have to you have to see normalized to understand what is normal. But once you've seen a few normalized, so then it can obviously be smaller than normal or larger than normal. We use the term patulous to explain to describe a very distorted, open, and loose uh, punctum. A stenose punctum is one that is very tiny or very narrow or basically, you know, almost closed. The normal punctum is obviously in between. So a stenose punctum basically can be dilated with a nettle ship's punctum dilator. And if you do the dilatation, it will start a complaint they have of warping and inflammation and redness will come down. A patulous punctum basically is often a sign of inflammation because of something like a canaliculitis. So these people, along with that, will have some congestion around. And like I said, if they tell you they wake up in the morning with a lot of discharge, which is uh, concentrated in the medial canthal region, then you worry about the presence of canaliculitis if you see that open inflamed punctum. The way to confirm that is to put an anesthetic and then use two cotton swabs and then pour one inside the lid and one outside the lid. If it's the left eye, you go medial to the, can the canthus, the punctum, and then you start massaging firm pressure with your two canaliculi, with your two cotton buds, I'm sorry, 
and then you'll see something pop out a concretion that pops out through the opening this you take on a needle and then put it on a slide and send it off and it will often be something like an actinomyces or a nocardia or something like that the other thing that we took at in terms of the punctum is the position like i said in a normal lower lid punctum you cannot see it until you actually evert the lid by pulling it down with your finger only then the punctum will come into view because the normal position that is that it's slightly interned and in a position with the bulbar conjunctival surface now if you look at the patient without touching and if you can already see the punctum either facing upwards or facing outwards towards you that is a lax lid with a punctal eversion so with the punctum you look for the position you look for the uh, opening size and you look for the presence of inflammation around it and these are the three things that you can generally look at okay sir the last question in elderly patients uh, most of them have blocked meibomian glands so should we really treat them even when the patients are asymptomatic Uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, when we treat the ocular surface, there are two important reasons why we treat them. One is to basically make sure that the ocular surface does not come to harm, and the other is to get rid of patient symptoms. So when the patient comes to you with symptomatology and you see meibomian gland dysfunction, obviously you treat it if you're if you're convinced that the gland dysfunction is responsible for his symptoms. if you see what you think is gland dysfunction but the patient says i'm quite happy i just came for my glass check then you evaluate the surface if you see that kind of corneal vascularization that i showed you in some of the pictures or if you see an evaporative dry eye with a stain on it then you're bound to treat it because even if the patient is asymptomatic if you don't treat it we know that bad things will happen in time why is the patient asymptomatic is partly because of the sign symptom disconnect that i told you if the nerves on the surface are also not working too well for various reasons if the inflammation has already damaged the nerves and they're not taking the feedback back then the patient will not be aware that anything is wrong so even in somebody with a meibomian gland dysfunction who is not complaining if you see corneal surface staining if you see significant limbal vascularization that is inflamed all around then you must treat Okay, sir. So one more question: What is the role of low potency steroids in uh, meibomian dysfunction and blepharitis patients? Ah, uh, meibomian gland dysfunction basically is almost always associated with some inflammation of the ocular surface. So particularly when you are doing all this massage and all to bring the glands under control, you must remember that when you are massaging, you are bringing all that. bad quality oil or infected oil onto the surface so there will be a momentary increase in the inflammation when you do that it's like pouring oil onto a burning fire it's already inflamed surface you're massaging bringing more of the stuff that causes the inflammation into the surface obviously they will get worse so whenever you start the massaging and all that it's it's good practice to also put a low potency steroid concurrently so my practice is to use a lotiprednol or a fluoromethylone three times a day for the first 5 days twice a day for the first 5 days and once a day for 5 days when they are doing this lid cleaning and massage and all that so as the stuff comes in this steroid will protect them from any increase in inflammation and in about 2 to 3 weeks as the lid gets better the inflammation will also come down and the steroids can be withdrawn so in general when you start lid therapy with all these measures it is probably good practice to put a small course of a low potency steroid for 2 or 3 weeks that will help you Okay. Thank you so much sir. That was the end of the questions. Thank you so much for taking all the questions so patiently. Thank you very much. So my best wishes to all the graduates for their exams and all of you for a very wonderful new year. Let's hope it's a little better than the one we've had this year. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much Santosh for having Thank me. Thank you so Thank much. You wonderful lecture full of information. Thank I think it will take a while for them okay. to digest.